Number 28, letter A. Verify that the work input equals work output. For a hydraulic system, assuming no losses to friction, do this by showing that the distance the output force moves is reduced by the same factor that the output force is increased. Assume the volume of the fluid is constant. So um, I actually talked about this uh, in detail, except to just tie it into work uh, in problem number 27 here. Okay, so the prior, the problem prior to this one, number 27, uh, specifically, I think it's part C. Uh, just reference that. All right, because my discussion here is going to play off of that. Um, and uh, if you just watch number 27, it'll give you, it, it'll give you a good feel of how um, Pascal's principle kind of works and why we can amplify certain forces uh, because basically the heights of the, uh, or the, I should say the displacements of these cylinders are not the same. In any case, um, in the problem prior, remember the, the force uh, output FO relative to FI was 100 to 1. And we realized that at the conclusion of that problem, that the input height, or excuse me, that the output height relative to the input height was then one over 100, all right? So if you, if you notice, if you follow all the logic of the prior problem, look at the relationship, all right? The relationship here is exactly reciprocal to one another, all right? So the why is the output force magnified by 100? Uh, times the input force. Well, it's because the output distance or the output height is one hundredth that of the input height. What that means is that uh, to produce a hundred times more force here, you would have to push down here one hundred times deeper than this would rise. That's the whole idea. Okay. And then it says verify that the work input equals work output. Remember work is simply force times distance. So let's look at the work input. Let's use the value, then it would be force input times the distance or the height input, okay? By, by the way, H and D in this problem are, are tomato, tomato. They're the same thing. So if I were to now substitute my values in my Fi value, my F sub I, my input force is one here, okay? And my out, uh, input height, it was 100, okay? So 1 times 100 is obviously 100. Then what about the work output? Well, that would have been the force output times the, the output height. So what was the, what was the uh, output force? Well, 100. What's the output height? It's 1. What's 100 times 1? 100, right? So these two are indeed equal. All right, it's, it almost seems counterintuitive uh, in terms of like, how could we magnify the force? It doesn't seem, well, the reason why is because like I said, the distance uh, or the height that the piston uh, increases by is exactly uh, a reciprocal of how much the force increases by. But if you notice here, we don't violate any laws, right? Input work is equal to output work. Input energy is equal to output energy, all right? Um, yeah, assuming that the volume is constant, no friction, all that mumbo jumbo. So, letter B. It says now, uh, what effect would friction within the fluid and between components in the system have on the output force? How would this depend on whether or not the fluid is moving? So, um, if the fluid, if, you know, when, when this piston drops down, right, it displaces a certain amount of, a certain volume of, as explained in number 27, a certain volume of uh, fluid. And this piston now, let me just grab the right color. This piston now is going to come up, right? And increase, whoop, and increase by the same volume. Okay, not the same height, but the same volume. Okay, so this will increase by the same volume. So what's in the red, I mean, this picture is not to scale, but what's in the red, what's shaded in red should equal what's shaded in yellow here. Now, um, it says, right, how this depend on whether the fluid is moving or what effects would friction have here? Um, so if, as this volume is now displaced over to here, right, if the fluid is now moving along and scraping against the surface here, right, anytime you get movement along a surface, there's some friction. So anytime you get this water, these water molecules moving across this jaggedy surface, right, we're losing some of the energy to friction. We're losing some work to friction. Now, remember, conservation of 
energy and, and, and work here is there, there's no violation, meaning that if you have a certain input work, okay, a certain amount of energy inputted into the system, that will equal the energy that's outputted. However, this number will be reduced if there is friction of a, of a moving liquid against the surface of the container. So what I'm trying to say is that the input work should equal the actual output work plus any type of frictional losses. Okay, so we can see that mathematically, right? If I were to solve this for the actual output work, we would subtract the friction on over to the left-hand side here. So what we realize here is that the uh, output work should then be less than the input work. Now, uh, which of these two variables will all will be altered? Right? Is it going to be the height that's uh, outputted, or is it going to be the force? Well, remember, the fluid, we're assuming that it's not compressible. So the fluid in here is not compressible. And therefore, the height will have to be the same. Okay, but the amount of force then will be less. Okay, so we realize that, I mean, in terms of this problem, the value was 100. We would say that the output force would now have to be less than 100 for this specific example. All right, remember, the volume, it's incompressible. Therefore, whatever volume was here also now is translated in red, that is, whatever volume is in red, was also translated into yellow. So the, the height, in theory, will not change. It's still going to obtain a certain... Uh, absurd, uh, you know, a certain height. However, the amount of force that it can generate will be less. All right. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. I really do appreciate it very much. Please remember to subscribe and we'll see you next time. Thank you.